So um, it's great to have with us uh, Professor Harlan E. Spence. He earned his BA in astronomy and physics at Boston University in 1983, and his MS and PhD in geophysics and space physics at UCLA 1985 and 1989. His early research was on the physics of the terrestrial magnetosphere, namely global structure and dynamics of space plasmas. Between 1989 and 1994, um, he worked at the Aerospace Corporation in El Segundo, where he had his first experimental <coughs> experience, leading the development of an energetic charged particle instrument on the NASA Polar Mission. In 1994, he returned to Boston University as an assistant professor of astronomy and moved up through the ranks to full professor and department chair over his 15 years there. In 2010, um, he joined the University of New Hampshire where he assumed the directorship of the Institute for the study of Earth, oceans, and space and also um, holds a professorship in the Department of Physics. So I'll turn it over now to um, Dr. Spence. Um, I'll do your bio after him. Um, thank you uh, so much for the opportunity to speak this morning. I know that I'm the only thing keeping you from Rennie, and Rennie is the only thing keeping us from lunch, so I will try to keep us moving ahead here. So uh, apologies for the cutesy attempt at a, a title that is sexy in some way, uh, but I really wanted to focus on small and enabling and experimental. And so what I really want to do here is um, impress upon you how uh, with CubeSats and SmallSats, I'm really going to focus on CubeSats, but it's generally small sats, we really have an opportunity for opening up uh, a number of scientific realms that are important in, across the disciplines that um, we've heard about, but really mapping into uh, earth science, including ocean uh, science, looking at ocean color, for instance, a lot of opportunities in the earth sciences, in space science, planetary, and uh, astrophysics, I believe. So uh, as motivation and background, I would say in terms of uh, the funding situation at agencies, we're in a uh, period of some challenge. There are limited resources, and uh, in particular in the solar and space physics, uh, the area that I have most of my uh, funding through, heliophysics and a little bit in planetary, um, there are challenges ahead. We have several missions that are planned. Uh, there have been decadal surveys that have laid out the science priorities for the decades. The most recent one completed that I served on in 2012 in solar and space physics identified a number of flagship missions that are very large, um, take a long time, involve a lot of the community, and are uh, broad, but leave behind a number of science topics that are important, but are lacking in terms of uh, specific missions. So uh, there are a number of opportunities, though, and the survey points this out, where low-cost missions that allow for outstanding scientific discovery can be accomplished. And we can do that through explorer type missions, but also smaller missions that uh, I believe are important that involve small sats and CubeSats. And I'm really going to focus on CubeSats here today. But uh, th there is that spectrum from CubeSats, which is a, a particular type of small sat, up to the kinds of uh, missions that we heard in, in the last talk, the 50 kilogram or, or so cl class. So what is a CubeSat? Um, this is way larger than life. Uh, most of the satellites you've seen have been shrunk down to fit on the scheme. This one is blown up so that you can see it. Um, they're 10 centimeters on a side is the standard 1U, uh, for, stands for one unit. It was a, um, you could call it a Pico satellite if you start doing the, the powers of 10, which really don't scale for satellites, but that's a whole other historic um, anomaly. Uh, developed by Jordi Puigsari and Bob Twiggs at Cal Poly and Stanford back in 1999. Uh, it's a standard that allows, uh, at relatively low cost, a, uh, an organization, traditionally it was uh, developed for the university setting, to uh, provide uh, through what's called a P-Pod here. This is a uh, launcher that takes uh, three of these individual units stacked in a, a P-Pod delivery system as a ride share, typically, to space uh, as a secondary payload or shared payload with another uh, mission that's paying the, the bulk of the cost of the launch for low cost uh, and simple but safe to the primary payload access to space. It 
These typically are, have, uh, within the university community, relied heavily on COTS parts or, in the case of the kind of missions that I've been involved with, heavily leveraging uh, other NASA missions that have developed sensors and sensor technologies that can be brought to bear to uh, focused missions that are, can be achieved on small, very small payloads. So uh, at least from, in, in a, I'm, I'm giving this through the eyes of a university faculty member, so I'm gonna focus at least initially on the um, NSF CubeSat program, which was really the portal through which universities got involved. Uh, that program started in and around uh, 2008, and it has been and continues to be run through the geospace and atmospheric science and education uh, out of the geospace section of uh, the geosciences directorate at the NSF. And the person there who has really spearheaded that program is Teresa Moretto, and I thank her for her contributions um, to that program and also to this talk. Uh, over the incept since the inception of the program, there have been on average about two new projects per year competitively funded. The first one's really focused on the uh, phenomena of space weather, uh, but has broadened uh, now to include greater than 80 unique missions proposed, and the numbers uh, continue to grow every year. I've, this was from an earlier presentation. I'm not quite sure exactly how many have been funded now, but it's uh, significantly more than 12, it's probably 15 or, or, or even more. The, um, they're funded as grants, not a contract which is kind of hard for somebody coming from a NASA spacecraft uh, domain, as I do, involved in billion dollar programs, where the delivery of paper far exceeds anything that you could imagine in, in, in the form of a CubeSat in terms of mass time and, and effort and everything, pretty much. But it's a grant, it's best level of effort. Uh, and so NSF uh, allows for a tremendous amount of risk then, in a way that NASA uh, uh, fears. And uh, uh, so that has been, uh, coming out of double-dead sword. We've had a lot of CubeSat missions fail, but we've also uh, been able to do things uh, outside the traditional approach that NASA would impose uh, that has probably led to some failures as well. So very small in the context of, of cost, 900,000 total, typically three years in duration. Uh, but I would say over the, the course of this program, uh, it has certainly uh, generated a lot of opportunities for students to be involved in a program from beginning to end, cutting their teeth and learning the, the ways of system engineering and, and good engineering practices that can then be brought to bear in the professional domain uh, with uh, seasoned professional engineers and, and young scientists, but also really demonstrating scientific value. Uh, here's a, an array of some of the uh, missions that have flown thus far or in uh, late development. Um, I'm going to focus on this one here because that is the one uh, we actually started at Boston University when I was there, uh, then executed uh, both Firebird 1 and 2 missions from the University of New Hampshire, so I'll, I'll be talking about uh, that mission in a little bit. Uh, I would say in terms of where CubeSats really have made their mark, it's really been in low Earth orbit from the university science point of view. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of good science that can be done from there, so it's, a, it's not only a convenient place to go to where uh, link margins are very favorable, uh, and it's, it, it, it has, I think, uh, proven its, its merits. Um, so many of the capabilities needed to conduct the science uh, have, been, have been demonstrated or will be soon. And so uh, when you think about the basic measurements in, of space plasmas that you want to uh, make, in space, that includes the in situ magnetic and electric fields, the energetic and su super thermal particles, at lower energies, the plasmas, and then the neutral particles, and then the aspects of the system, the dynamics of the uh, neutral winds, the composition of the particles, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, radio waves, we have VLF and UHF trans uh, transceivers, and uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, X-ray detectors, gamma ray detectors, and so forth. Um, in addition, uh, we are now, I think, developing the small, effective, uh, efficient, small sensors that can do remote sensing of things like the Aurora Borealis, looking at atmospheric uh, air glow, 
uh, conducting radio occultation experiments, and uh, solar imaging and flare observations in the X-ray uh, wavelength. So uh, you can see the size of some of these sensors. They have to be small to fit into these small form factors. Um, the original CubeSats were just 10 centimeters on a side. You can now do them in non-integer units, but, uh, well, sorry, uh, sub-elements can be non-integer, but typically they have to fit into a 3U uh, P-pod or a 6U dispenser and on up in uh, powers of three, essentially. We're talking about uh, 27Us as well. Uh, they have to be small. They have to be low resource. And so that's a challenge for some projects that require large aperture. But in LEO, uh, things have really been proven. And let me talk just now a little bit about our Firebird missions. We've had two missions. We've had uh, four spacecraft uh, uh, that have operated uh, starting in late uh, 2013. Uh, Firebird 1 consisted of two identical flight units here. They are one and a half U each. So there's the non-integer number. You put two of those together, you get three. So these uh, stacked end on end and went into a single P-pod. So uh, the first Firebird uh, mission lasted not quite a year. The second Firebird mission launched in late 2015 and continues to, to keep on going. Firebird stands for Focused Investigation of a Relativistic Electron Burst Intensity Range and Dynamics. <laughs> I, I've never said that quite so, so emphatically, and I'm glad I remembered it. Uh, we, we tend to use Firebird. It's a, a mission that is uh, looking at precipitation of relativistic electrons from Earth's radiation belts that are dumped into the atmosphere. With a single spacecraft, when you fly through these at low altitude, you have no idea that this burst that lasts tens of milliseconds, was that spatial, was it temporal? And so with this focused mission, with a single instrument, we're able to answer scientific questions that the $650 million Van Allen probes mission cannot. And so we're operating during that mission and uh, Together, we're really uh, being able to answer questions that, uh, that are important and decadal survey type class questions. Uh, so here's some data from the first Firebird mission. And, I, and because there have been so many missions that haven't worked optimally, I really like to show that some of these missions really have been highly successful and returning data that are publishable in the top journals. So this is a uh, particular case when the Van Allen probes uh, spacecraft, the large uh, flagship mission in the uh, heliophysics uh, area at NASA, two twin spacecraft, fully complemented measuring uh, energetic particles at the magnetic equator in the radiation belt. Uh, when we had an underflight by the two Firebird units connecting on the magnetic field line, uh, and at that time we were able to compare the trapped particles out in the radiation belt relative to the particles that are making it way down into the lost cone that are precipitating into the atmosphere. And so for the first time, we were able to delineate clearly the uh, degree to which the particles were precipitating, what fraction uh, were going down. It's a relatively small fraction. And we were able to see how that precipitation process, the particles as they're scattered, uh, and the efficiency of that over the energy range of interest uh, where these particles are resonating with uh, electromagnetic waves at the equator. So this was a really, I would say, a discovery class uh, measurement made with this very simple set of instrumentation. So following Firebird 1, we had Firebird 2, same acronym, same name, same mission essentially, uh, but improved. Uh, the first mission, they didn't operate at the same time. And that Allowed, didn't allow us to reach full mission closure. Uh, so we uh, went back to NSF and at uh, 20 cents on the dollar, we're able to build two more uh, spacecraft. It was launched as a secondary payload in the SMAP launch that uh, I suspect a number of folks from JPL were at Vandenberg with us watching that uh, launch of the uh, soil moisture uh, active, passive. active passive. Yeah, I always forget the AP. Uh, and so there we are going up into space. And uh, lo and behold, we've had some fantastic measurements. And we uh, are now getting the first uh, publications. This mission was designed to last uh, three months. 
We are now in 18 months of operation. We are on our ninth campaign, I believe, uh, in terms of how the data is collected. And in this particular example, I show data from the two units made back here a little over a year ago, separated in time by three minutes, flying through a region where we see uh, structured precipitation of these uh, energetic electrons from a few hundred kilo electron volts up to almost a mega electron volt that are coming from the radiation belt. And conventional wisdom is that you shouldn't see structured precipitation that's spatial. And what we're seeing is that these things are temporally uh, stable over the course of three minutes. So the theorists are shaking their head and we're holding their feet to the fire to help us explain what's going on here. So I would say from the point of view of low Earth orbit, we have examples now where uh, the CubeSats are really showing great scientific return on investment. So for a relatively small amount of money, you can do focused science that has a fairly large impact. Uh, there are a number of creative mission ideas and successful implementations that's leading to the kinds of outcomes as scientists that we uh, desire for, scientific discovery, great data, and publications. In addition, of course, we have students involved very heavily with uh, large educational uh, impact. So I would say that uh, whereas initially it was a, a bit of a uh, s sort of uh, you know, stunt perhaps from a scientific point of view, I would say at this point we're really now cross that border and are into the realm of being able to do uh, first-rate science on a CubeSat. When we move to MIO and HEO, I would say we have a lot of exciting potential, but we haven't quite gotten there yet in terms of realizing some decadal survey class missions, including uh, one that's near and dear to my heart called Magnetospheric Constellation. It's been in the last two decadal surveys. We uh, can't imagine doing it with conventional technologies, with large satellites, but one can em envision now doing this um, with small satellites. A challenge with all of these from the technical point of view, from the scientist, when we uh, propose these and go through TIMCO reviews is communication and power. And uh, so when we think about communication, we're, we're now really excited about the possibility of laser communication. There are other issues there, but those are, I would say, secondary in terms of the uh, communication issue. Uh, this chart is one that uh, came from a, um, some work that showed how we go from uh, what was then the present to uh, into the future. Uh, in terms of the science priorities. Each one of these missions here represents a heliophysics mission. Uh, the ones here that uh, y you can see that are colored in some ways uh, down here have been realized in black. The other ones are notional. And uh, pretty much when you think about all the missions, we're, over time we're seeing missions that uh, used to be a single spacecraft that are now either clusters of spacecraft, maybe up to four that are in tight formation, or constellations that in involve tens or even hundreds of spacecraft needed to look at system level type uh, measurements. Uh, this is a real challenge, of course, and so as the number of spacecraft go up and as the launcher size remains the same, you have to make them smaller, uh, you have to have a lot of data, you want to get that data back, and so again, uh, LaserCom is pretty clear uh, as a implementing factor on these small uh, missions. Uh, small spacecraft. Uh, this illustration just shows a, a notional configuration of spacecraft arrayed in nested orbits around the Earth, uh, measuring the invisible magnetic fields and plasmas that populate this region that are ultimately responsible for uh, phenomena such as the aurora and much of the space weather that we think about uh, associated with magnetic substorms and storms. So CubeSats beyond Earth. Um, and, and I would say this is where we have really some very exciting opportunities. Um, many of these missions could be done today, however, they're really limited by the communication. And an example of this is a proposal that a number of us um, worked on in recent times, um, including me, Rennie, and uh, Dave Klumpar, Montana State University, where our, our goal was to get into interplanetary space on an orbit that would take us on a trajectory toward Venus, essentially following a 
magnetic field line from the sun. As the sun rotates, it's, it's uh, rotating, it's giving off plasma radially. That plasma carries with it a magnetic field, and just like a, a water sprinkle traces out a, a spiral. And essentially, uh, this particular orbit would take us along that spiral and allow us to make measurements on Earth and along that spiral, along the trajectory of particles that stream along magnetic field lines from the sun. This is a uh, priority within the decadal survey, and we could do it with a CubeSat. We had the measurements, and uh, really what happened was exciting science. The, uh, we thought we made a very compelling case. However, the, the NASA review panel was quite skittish about uh, the technical readiness and risk. And so to me, this really underscores the importance of this workshop. We really want to get to the point where this is no longer a question. It's a capability that exists. It's been tested and proven. It's really going to enable a lot of, uh, uh, of science, not only in LEO and MEO and HEO, but into inter interplanetary space. So let me uh, summarize and conclude. Um, We'll always have large strategic mission, but there's a real role for these small uh, satellites that are uh, driven by scientific uh, exploration from individual principal investigators. Um, they complement the larger missions, and so I think there's a real opportunity for a synergy between the large and the small. Uh, and I think there are these innovative approaches. The community is ready, but the funding agencies really need to step to the plate to develop those technologies that help reduce the risk. And I think a uh, key one here is the laser communication technology. And there are those who said that, you know, in the science community, this is crazy. How do you do optical communication? And my response is, those who assert that it cannot be done should never interrupt those who are already doing it, <laughs> which is really a segue to Rennie. So I'll let him take the, uh, take the charge from here. So last but not least, it's um, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rennie Fields, who's been leading, co-leading this um, study with me. Um, Dr. Rennie Fields has been involved in laser source development and laser sensor systems engineering for his entire 31-year career at the Aerospace Corporation. He's a corporate fellow in the Electronics and Photonics Lab and is currently the PI on the Mafia Mount Wilson Ground Station and the NASA LMPC CubeSat. He was the PI on M-Fire laser communication experiment in collaboration with the German MOD and DLR and TSAT, as well as a key advisor to government on several space radar sensors, both planned and in orbit. Dr. Fields was asked by NASA to chair the blue ribbon panel reviewing the anomaly analysis for ISAT. He and his aerospace collaborators defined a radiation hard recipe for NDAG flight lasers that was adopted by NASA and others in the industry. Through aerospace, Dr. Fields was asked to serve as the key laser terminal system engineer for the Teledesic constellation. Throughout his career, he has published numerous papers and reports on laser device and component development. He also served as general chair of the CLIO conference in 2002. He has a PhD in chemical physics from the University of Chicago. Please welcome Dr. Rennie Fields. <laughs> can't live up to that, uh, <laughs> as you'll see. Um, I have to make a disclaimer first, because aerospace has uh, generally rigorous uh, paper approval processes, which didn't collaborate with our timeline. So I had to pick charts that I uh, had existing, and I'll try to weave some of the story uh, verbally through them. Plus. Um, my colleagues here have uh, done a lot of the work for me, and so I think I'd like to also move my talk in a realm that kind of fills in some of the gaps that are relevant to this symposium. Um, so first, if I had had a chart that I wanted to start with, it would basically be kind of a performance chart for Deep Space Optical Com kind of saying, what are, you know, what are the existing systems that we have? One of them, clearly DSOC right now, and the LLCD would be very close to it in terms of mass and aperture, uh, pointing requirement, power. And then I would put someplace else on that same performance map the system that we proposed with Harlan about a year and a half ago, which was based on um, a lot of the stuff, the pieces that I'm going to show you in my talk. 
Now in that, in that separate system, because we had some good negotiations with Harlan for what he could accommodate in his science, he was saying, okay, I can get away with, let's say, a half an hour to an hour of five kilobit com, and we could size that within a 6U, obviously having to relax the pointing. Um, we didn't relax power. We probably are putting out using more power, laser power, but that only goes linear to data rate versus the benefits that you get from having a tighter beam. And then there is this whole question of um, how well can you point a small sat? And that, that's something that, um, unfortunately, we don't have a talk in this pre-session, but we'll have it in the symposium. And I'll refer, at least in one of my later charts, to um, where are we at. And then I think there's one thing that I also kind of want to get in your head before I get into some of the details. And that is that what we're seeing right now, especially on um, let's say the defense side, which I think really moves into this question for deep space uh, laser com, is that um, small sats are really taking on a different definition. So for example, you'll see companies like Millennium or uh, Space Systems Loral advertise hardware, which is equivalent to about 27U. But really, it doesn't have to be 27U. It just has to be approximately that, because their production techniques can pretty much accommodate anything close to that. And then when you look at the cost of these missions, and several of these missions are actually up. And so we have the dollars that we paid them and what it cost them to build them. And they are definitely following the same cost models that we have for the CubeSats at least separate of the launch. So obviously, and, and honestly, launch for CubeSats is no uh, cherry pick either these days because there are so many people trying to do it. And so it's hard if you especially want to get an Alana launch, which I'll refer to in, in one of my charts uh, for my uh, NASA ESTO mission. I mean, you're not going to get on. You have to be far enough in advance to, to hold your slot, get your slot, and then hold on to it. So there's going to be, you'll see a little bit of shift, I think. There are ventures in New Zealand now that are launching these small sats um, for relatively low dollars compared to the kind of stuff. And then if you were going to do a constellation or multiple satellites, SpaceX has clearly blown that dollar model out where you could consider launching 10 50 kilogram satellites for, for relatively little money. So. Um, uh, I'm using lots of people's work, uh, and I just wanted to acknowledge it. I'll probably say their names again when I get to some of the detailed charts. And um, actually, I left off my co-eyes for my NASA ESTO CubeSat. But um, I think this was covered pretty well. These, these first two charts are um, really the details of what DSOC is. And if there's any question, you know, we can go back to them. But it's essentially uh, it's challenging in the sense that it's pushing the pointing down to under a microradian in terms of pointing control. You know, the beam width is larger than that, but you usually want your control to be about one quarter or one tenth of your beam width. And, um, and so doing that is what's driving their increased performance. It has a four watt laser, which is is an area which we can improve on. Uh, and, it, and then there are also uh, some areas in terms of what the peak power of the laser is, especially using some of the waveforms that uh, Brian referred to. Um, the package is significant improvement over what Mars LaserCom was. It's about, I think, one third and then half the power. And so it's not quite. So if I were drawing that slide that I want, I'd have over here, you know, this 28 kilogram piece. The piece that I was going to fly with Harlan was probably about uh, two to three kilograms in terms of what the fraction of the system is. So how do we, how do we carve out that other space where the smart places to move to? So um, uh, AC7, which is kind of an internal term. 
This is the OCSD mission, which was funded by Ames. Uh, it was originally going to be a proximity mission, but when we said we were going to do laser comm, that became the prime uh, mission for uh, this program. And this is a uh, kind of a, um, what shows you actually how the laser is constructed. For the most part, these are all COTS items. And you uh, can piece together a laser in the sense that by using, uh, let me see, is this the right one? Yeah. Okay. So by using a, t typically a DFB laser, I can pretty much do any of the waveforms for whether this is a, uh, I mean, I can't do a phase coherent waveform, but I can do any direct detection waveform, either in the PPM realm or within a various types of direct detection coding approaches because of the flexibility of this. The only thing I have to be concerned about is do I exceed the peak power properties if I'm definitely going to have shorter and shorter pulses. And I'm going to get to that in, in a couple of slides. But the two-stage amplifier system for, and this was uh, developed by Todd Rose and his team at Aerospace, and actually one is sitting in orbit. It was launched uh, mid last year. Unfortunately, there was a software error on the management of that CubeSat. It's a one and a half U. Um, and so we couldn't get the, the laser to operate because we couldn't get that side of the operational system to work. But there are two more going up on uh, Formosat 5. The pre-ship review was uh, the end of last week. Um, that's still on uh, stage to launch in October. And essentially, uh, two more CubeSats will have um, this. It won't have exactly this, because what we discovered is that our pointing is moving along at a very good rate. And we really didn't need the 10 watts. And even on the 7A mission, we scaled back the power to a comfortable 6 watts. Um, so when we said, hey, let's, let's build the other two, we decided it was sufficient to do two watt systems, which essentially cut this package in half. It's about a little over a centimeter, about a centimeter and a half in terms of thickness. So, um, but we still have this package, and honestly, it can, with a few more improvements, we could reliably run this in space at 10 watts. And this was the basis of the proposal with Harlan. We plan to fly three of these in parallel with one inch apertures, which were compatible with where we thought we would be by the launch date, which was to be able to have a um, control and knowledge of about a hundredth of a degree, which would be compatible with that beam width. And so that was significantly more performance than we could achieve with the software defined radio. This just shows these kinds of um, packages being, uh, this is equivalent of a production line for us uh, in a laboratory-oriented uh, organization. So where do we go from there? Well, it turns out that there are a bunch of other missions that we're doing for other applications, particularly LIDAR applications. And a lot of those are also space-based. And in those cases, we want really high peak powers. And you know, a comment that I didn't really make in the previous slide is, so, you know, when Susanna was going through, a large part of my career was not doing, but observing all the problems in every laser that we were ever trying to launch. And a lot of those had to do with lasers that are composed of a lot of discrete elements, where you have to make sure each element is aligned to micro, micro radian class alignments, plus you have interfaces where um, any kind of uh, um, contamination could impact the laser performance. Well, when you start to go to a fully spi spliced, fusion spliced fiber system, now there are no interfaces except for the exit. And then secondly, the fiber mass itself is so low that you can actually have, and we've tested this, free flopping uh, fiber in your, in your package because it just doesn't have enough mass under the um, qualification levels to be disturbed. And so as long as you're 
holding your key components and where those interfaces are, that turns out to be a significantly easier qualification approach to the laser system. So now, um, could this system fit in the same package? No. And, and part of that is when I want to get 0.5 millijoules out, let's say in an 8 nanosecond pulse, I would blow off the fiber in that case. But when I apply an engineered fiber, in this case, this is a um, uh, n light uh, tapered fiber, which basically takes a single mode and adiabatically expands it up to 60 microns. And so as long as a single mode is still um, the primary mode and the other modes can't get any traction, what gets emitted is now a single mode, but now from a 60 micron aperture. And now I can support that kind of peak power. And now we're talking about 100 to 1,000 times more photons in the one pulse. And then this system can basically be modulated definitely up to the megabit, megabit class, or I mean megahertz class, which if I'm doing 16 airy or whatever, means that I can do hundreds of megabits. Um, and these systems we have in some engineering model constructions can be built up to 50 watts currently and probably even higher and still fit in packages that are kind of like a small deep dish pizza, maybe two to three inches in height. And for, for the euterbium uh, taper fiber, the um, curvature is about eight inches. Uh, the photonic crystals are more like 10 to 12 inches. So that's where this argument of do I want to stay in a, in a U-class system or put it in diagonally and make that be the first thing, or do I choose a slightly larger cross-section and still have a satellite that is cost-effective to that kind of approach? Um, so the other area to attack, especially if I'm uplinking, uh, is to have a space-qualified single photon receiver that has bandwidth. Um, so this is uh, a mission that we have uh, under NASA ESTO. We were supposed to launch in about two months, but uh, this mission became funding challenged and has had a roadblock. So, uh, however, everything is technically there, and actually the two um, DRS detectors. This is uh, cooled Mercad Telluride. It uses a commercial off-the-shelf cooler that they sell, so the costs for these things are relatively low. The Mercad Telluride, while it doesn't have the jitter properties of the, um, of the superconducting detectors that were discussed by Brian and that are in uh, Abby's chart, um, they, they, do have, they do have the bandwidth up to, they just don't have the pulse jitter yet, and that's something that they can work on. But these are responsive to a single photon, and they have response from about 0.7 microns all the way up to four. And so you just have to fashion how you keep those other photons out so they don't get confused with the uh, data photons that you might be looking at. And um, in this particular satellite, uh, by the way, Jim Abshire and Shao Li Sun are my co-eyes and Jeff Beck at DRS. Um, we, you, you can, um, this first cut at this is actually operating at 500 mega samples per second on one of the pixels, but can take all 16 pixels at 20 mega samples per second. And all of that is, is more money, how much bandwidth you put on each pixel. And these are, the plan for this was a Vertex 7. And all this is designed to operate reliably in um, LEO orbit. So this does kind of bring up the possibility for very low laser powers going between small sats, definitely either in a planetary environment, you know, ground to the planet, or uh, Earth types of constellations. So when we didn't know cost for, let's say, and also encouraging my coworkers to drive the octal if we wanted to do 
ground experiments. This is a lot closer for us uh, from an aerospace perspective. We um, built our own station. This was one that we had developed with the Germans for doing characterization of downlinks from NFIRE when we were doing 5.6 gigabits of the ground on a coherent system because we wanted to understand the atmospheric physics. But that was constructed for a fraction of a million dollars with a, an off-the-shelf Mead telescope, 12 inch. That's actually going to be the first ground station for AC7, which will do essentially about two to 400 megabits per second from LEO. So now you do get this 100x gain in downlink capacity. That was our original goal for why to do laser comm was to get significantly more data for Earth LEO uh, science that we would be doing. Um, the, but Nan, when we were considering what we would do with Harlan, then we went to our other system, which is a 0.8 meter and is actually uh, being configured with a ground version of that DRS single photon detector. And now that, that gave us the ability with that to do the uh, data rates that uh, Harlan was referring to. Um, we have demonstrated, uh, this is uh, actually AeroCube 4, which in about a month will have been operating for four years on orbit. Um, and we have demonstrated full tracking uh, as it would cross the sky. So in other words, it could hold a half a degree pointing and, um, and, easy, and, we, and you can easily track it. So we can do a lot of characterization in the, how the pointing performance is for that and as we improve the various systems. Um, so really, where is the other big area? And I think we're going to later on in the week have a Blue Canyon discussion. For aerospace, uh, the big kind of breakthrough for our team, and we're anxious to get on-orbit data, is to take essentially COTS CMOS cameras. And then, and this is uh, Darren Rowan who developed this, uh, is it, this is a pointing system that's going to be limited by the precision of the star tracker. The other components that are in the system working together give us our inertial performance. The wheels easily have the control and do not provide sufficient jitter to disrupt the kind of pointing that we're talking about for these kinds of systems. And so um, the way Darren hopes to get to a hundredth of a degree is with uh, the current CMOS cameras getting, having enough resolution and then a very ingenious way of how much of the sky do you load and then how do you process that data real time. And then obviously if you're doing a real attitude control function, you're going to be doing that over time and so you're going to get an inertial behavior which is probably going to improve somewhat over what the resolution of the star camera is. And so this is where we hope to make the jump to the hundredth of a degree performance system. And by the way, if you look at um, Millennium's uh, data sheets, they're quoting uh, six thousandths of a degree for their star camera. And like us, all of they are a vertically integrated company. So they produce their own star cameras, they produce their own CMGs, and that's how they're doing uh, these size satellites, you know, 50 to 100 kilograms for uh, five to $10 million for the whole spacecraft. And this just kind of shows, you know, what one would do. I mean, this, this kind of system where if I were doing the demonstration between AC7 and AC9 with the single photon detector and only a one inch aperture to receive the photons, you're getting, um, about 2,000 photons over 2,000 kilometers, uh, you know, single photon counting. So I'm, I'm going to do, if I do a PPM type system, that's going to do 10 to 100 megabits per second. And obviously there are abilities to move out of this realm. So you have to pick something that is compelling, in essence like DSOC did for, um, you know, sort of a, a U.S. banner system. Um, we have to do the same thing in a CubeSat system 
and then understand what the points of deviation are. That's all I have. Okay, thank you.